And that's sort of what I'm saying with Bitcoin. It's like people go like, oh, yeah, it's going to be like running in sand, except I get sand slippers. And you go, no, 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 no. It's like you're just going to not be in the sand anymore. Bitcoin is the first money you cannot steal. What's the world look like when everybody is not short term thinking, scrambling to grab as much fiat as they can, levering up, going into debt, trying to cut prices? You go, oh, the world starts looking a lot better. Will there be taxation on the Bitcoin standard? Anybody can own property with egalitarian, zero trust access. Nobody can prevent you from owning that property. No one can seize that property from you. That means that everybody suddenly gets elevated to the level of a property holder. And I've never seen someone come into Bitcoin and go, yeah, I went full on in Bitcoin. And then like a year later, I gave up because this seemed stupid and I just quit. Like I want to go back to stacking ETH and trying to gamble on meme tokens. Like I've never seen that happen. You're doing something that I've never seen before. Probably some people have done it before. Uh, you are writing a book in, in real life time like you're writing yeah. <laughs> uh, chapter after chapter uh, you're now two from four chapters uh, is that correct uh yeah there are actually sections i'm kind of doing a four-part book um mm. and you know i'd been writing on medium for a long time and most of it was like shitcoin articles like back in the day and you know you can actually see my sort of my transfer into from a shitcoiner to a bitcoiner And it's all sort of live in real time in that history. And, and most of my shitcoin articles were kind of more oriented towards letting people know, like, hey, this is kind of a hustle and this is how you game the hustle. But, you know, don't get caught up and because it's all sort of nonsense. Right. But sooner or later, I, I think I actually sat down and watched the Sailor Breed Love series. Like I actually put out an article where I was sort of crapping on Michael Sailor and like his ideas about perfect money and stuff. And I mean, it's so embarrassing to look back on now. I mean, it's still out there. You can still go look at it. And yet. You know, when I realized just how arrogant and sort of full of myself that I was, that I could sit here and look at this guy who goes like, who's clearly spent a lot of time and effort investigating this, thinking about it and is devoting an enormous amount of capital capital to the enterprise for me to sit there and go, huh, I know what's up. <laughs> so it was a little embarrassing there, but to get to your question, yes, I, I finally sort of turned into like a full on Bitcoiner um, and With all that writing and all that background that I've got, because I've got a legal research background and I've published a bunch of legal articles and I've got a criminological background with some peer reviewed research that's been published and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, rather than sitting here just putting out these ding dong articles every week, like, why don't I just sort of focus my energy? And uh, I wanted to write a book. And part of my thing, though, is, is, you know, depending on how many people think what I have to say is valuable is sort of up in the air. It might be 10 people. It might be 10,000, might be 10 million. I don't know. But ultimately my goal is to like, I want to push whatever I can out to the world because I, I work from this assumption that there's somebody somewhere who's going to get what I'm saying is, and it's going to click for them. You know, whereas someone like you might have said something and I'll say it just slightly different and it'll register for them, but it won't register for the person you were talking to. And just like when Michael Saylor talks to people, there's a lot of people that just inherently go, oh, I don't like what this guy's saying. He's talking about money and riches and, you know, and, and where that might be outputting for them. And he obviously has an enormous reach. And yet I feel like the more people we can get on board with this, the more people we can bring into it, the better off we are. So with that in mind, I was like, well, I'm just going to put this book out for free. I mean, I'll eventually I'll probably make it into a paperback. I know there are some people who just don't like reading off a website or whatever, and maybe I'll charge a couple bucks for that or something. I don't know. But in the meantime, I, I wanted to take away that sort of that, that weird incentive perception that says, oh, this guy's just doing this to make a buck. You know, it's like, no, this is important information. People need to see it. And I just want people to have it, uh, whether they use it or not, whether they want to crap on it or not, or whether they really get behind it. It's all sort of for the net benefit. The discussion around Bitcoin, I think, is important. And then as I came to that conclusion, I was like, well, why don't I just write it? while I, I mean, I can just publish it as I go. I don't have to like wait until it's done and keep editing. And part of that was also in this sort of like spirit of giving where you kind of go, there's a lot of people like on medium or just writers in general that go, Oh, you know, I, and they think about writing and they talk about writing, but they rarely do the writing or they, they rarely understand what that process looks like. And I'm a very prolific writer. I've probably written, you know, in my lifetime, probably close to three quarters of a million words. You know I mean? I've just, typed and put out a bunch of content. So I'm very comfortable, you know, I've done my 10,000 hours, so to speak. So I, I know I'm going to finish it. I know what it looks like to be productive. I know what it means to like, just get up and grind, even though you don't feel like writing. And I thought maybe somebody somewhere might benefit from that 
prospect too, where they could just sort of see like, oh, here's a paragraph that's a little clunky, and then they can see it as it's developed later on. I don't, I don't think anyone's really doing that, but that was sort of the impetus behind it. So, yeah, it's it's a fun experiment so far. I, I love the process. I mean, it's kind of also uh, my process with the with the podcast because I want to give. Uh, every lab that has like a Bitcoin background, a, a, a stage here and, and just like give as many perspective on Bitcoin as possible. That's why I do it every day with a different guest. I have like, you my 128th guest in uh, not even a half a year. <laughs> uh, so that's, it's, it's really great to have this. And um, what is the book uh, about? Like what's the, the, the main idea uh, be, behind the book? Uh, well, the book is called the great alignment, um, money, power, greed, and Bitcoin. And a lot of my legal research and, you know, one of the things like if you trace back into my history a little bit, I, I was pretty hardcore libertarian type guy, like sort of drifting into the ANCAP, like, you know, smash the state and we don't need it and just, you know, free trade, free exchange. And, and that's, you know, it should all be voluntary relationships and, you know. And then I went to law school and what you find, especially studying, studying like American law, English law, the common law, um, that that's a historical record. And it goes back to, you know, like some of the cases you still read to this day in law school are coming from like the 1200s. And so it, when you see that historical narrative painted out that way, it, it's very different than like reading a history textbook. And like there's that saying that, you know, history is written by the winners, right? And all history has got a bias in it, and it's especially biased towards the people that are actually getting to write and document the history. Uh, the beauty of the legal historical record is that it it parses it out in a very neutral point of view, and and it's very static and very thoughtful people are documenting the history as it's going. But it's a history of human conflict. It's a history of, of creation of legal structures. It's the history of creating laws and, and how people navigate those changes. And And what I learned from that was that, you know, this, these very simplistic notions that I had from being like a libertarian and going, Oh, it should all be this. And, you know, they're, they're very simple ideas uh, that are addressing an enormously complex topic of like, how do you create a society and how do you create legal structures and where does all that come from? And my purpose with the book is to sort of break that down a little bit and just, you know, start giving people a, a a slightly different paradigm to work from uh, because people say things like, Oh, Bitcoin needs to replace fiat. And I go, okay, do you know what that looks like though? And they go, well, of course it will just, you know, and they assume that like the world's going to look exactly the way it does now, except it'll be fair. And I go, well, if you think about the development of everything we're doing right now was built on fiat, right? Like the roads that we drive on are built on fiat, the houses we live in, the jobs we go to, the internet we're talking over, the military systems, the buildings that, literally everything in the world is built on top of a fiat mindset. And so the question then becomes like, what does it look like if you didn't build it with fiat? You go, what does the world look like? You go, it's almost impossible to imagine, right? So I, I want to start getting people, my goal and my purpose with this is to go like, look, Bitcoin is enormous. And it, it's not just because, you know, number go up or not just because, you know, a bank can put it on its balance sheet or someone can do black market transactions and buy cocaine in Bolivia with it. It's, it's bigger than that in that it's the first time in the history of humanity where you can have a competitive market structure that's predicated on a fair rule set. And, and I think when people start really incorporating what that means, I think Jeff Booth does a really good job of like sort of tracking this out and kind of going, you, you can't really understand what that model is because there's nothing to model from, right? And I, I just want to start shaking the tree a little bit and just going, hey, you're like when we talk about money, a lot of the things we assume about money aren't exactly the way they get portrayed in economics textbooks or you know even some of the Bitcoin people and the way they talk about money. They miss some kind of key components of it. And the same thing with like power structures and the same thing with like, where does greed come from and where does authority come from and sovereignty and, and what all this means. I, I just want to, like I said, I guess the best way to do it is or to say it is just shake the tree a little bit and just go, Hey, there's some, there's stuff up there that you might not have thought about. And I just want people to start incorporating that and thinking about it. And that's the ultimate hope because uh, like I said, I think Bitcoin is such an enormous transformative technology that it's, I mean, it's almost wonderful to think about like what the world looks like without a fiat standard. And I also go, it's, I don't think it's going to look like this where we go down to the local clothing store and have a selection of 
4,000 different sizes of clothes and 4,000 different colors. And it's all massively wasteful and ends up in junk piles in, in Africa because we just sort of dump stuff on the third world like that. And I don't think it's going to be necessarily like, you know, everyone wants to run out by a new iPhone or Bugattis are a big deal. I, I think a lot of that stuff just slowly deteriorates and goes away and, and we'll start finding this very sort of peaceful coexistence um, with specialization and, and very different a very different social structure, I think, is going to start to develop around this. And that, and I want to encourage people to start thinking that way because it, it you know, if you're in a fiat mindset, it, it's always toxic, you know. And I think my hope is that we can start just breaking free of some of those shackles, you know. I, I love that uh, what you said about uh, many colors and many like different sizes with, with the gloves. Um, I thought about something, uh, and this actually, uh, I have from Seinfeld and uh, I know that you worked on Seinfeld. I feel like, yeah. uh, he, he made an episode even with that, that uh, in the future, whenever we have like futuristic film and people come from the future, like the aliens or something like that, they always have like one suit on, like they always have like <laughs> the kind of like, well, let's, let's have one, one, <laughs> one, uh, um, piece of cloth on. And I just like thought of that, uh, um, when you t uh, talked about that, I mean, it's, it would be interesting to see if from the Bitcoin standard, we, we, we get rid of like this, this wastefulness and like kind of like have like more, um, um, how can I say like more, uh, classic clothing and like more, uh, uh, yeah, not, not as many, uh, different wasteful things to, to do. Like it will be really interesting. Uh, I mean, gloves is like one small part of it. Like when you go down yeah. the road, but, uh, I, I always, um, compare it with like running through sand and running on a solid street uh, and right. like feet is like running on sand and you like, you, yeah. you get ahead, you can do something, you, you can run, but it's, it's really hard and you, you, you likely fall, uh, and you likely get, <laughs> get, get on in the sand. And yes, you can also fall on the solid street. You can also, uh, uh, um, you also have to run on the solid street. It's not like, oh, you have Bitcoin. Now you, you can relax and not do anything. No, the, the, the whole, uh, opposite is the truth. You have to still work. You have to do something. So it will be really interesting to, to, to see the future, but let's first, yeah. uh, and you do it also with the book and uh, let's first look a little bit in the, in the history. What is like, uh, when you look at the history of money, what is like the, the main lesson you take away from that? And like, why is like Bitcoin now, like the next step of that evolution? Sure, man. Um, and before we get there, though, I'd like to say I, I love that analogy of like running through sand and tripping and falling. And I would just build on that a little bit. And sort of what I'm getting at with the book is like, just imagine your whole life you've been running on sand. And then someone said, oh, here's a road. And then what would you run like? I mean, you would just be like, I'm I'm a monster now. <laughs> like I can sprint. I can do all this crazy stuff. I can do cartwheels. And and all of a sudden it, it's fundamentally changes like how you approach running. Right. And that's sort of what I'm saying with Bitcoin is like people go like, Oh yeah, it's going to be like running in sand, except I get sand slippers. And you go, no, 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 no. It's like, you're just going to not be in the sand anymore. And that's a very, very different sort of look at things. Um, so that was great. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed that. I appreciate that. But um, in terms of money, I think, you know, people, when they look through the history of money, I, th I think probably the most common misconception about money and, and stop me if you've heard this, but uh, there, there's like a narrative out there right now that goes like, and like even Lynn Alden put out a video recently and she said, you know, well, back in the day they started with barter and barter became too complex because you can't divide a spear or you can't divide an ox cart or shoes or whatever. It, it becomes imbalanced. So they can't trade that way. So then they went to money and that that's the sort of logical step that everybody takes. And there was a great author by the name of David Graeber who put out a book called the debt, the first 5,000 years. And, and that was the book that sort of popped my brain. Uh, because he came out and it was while I was studying finance, while I was doing my master of laws that, that I saw this article and he said, yeah, that's a cool story. Like, you know, we went from barter, then it became money because barter was too hard. And then from money, we got credit and debt and that's how we got the money today. And he said, that's just false. It's just not true. But he said he could go anywhere in the world, say that story and people go, yeah, that's right. We used to barter. And then, but he said, no, you, there's, they have no evidence of a society ever developing that way. He said there's a lot of societies that developed like where they had a monetary system that collapsed and then people started bartering. 
But he said going from barter to commodity money to paper money, then to credit and debt, et cetera. He said it's, it's just sort of a, what he called the founding myth of economics, right? <laughs> and if you really start tracing back the the history, especially in the West, like the American economic system, which is sort of predicated on the British economic system and central banking and and all that kind of stuff, it what I find is that most money monetary systems are there built specifically for taxation, right? Like people go, oh, they need it to exchange value and things. And I go, well, kind of, but not really. And if you think about like medieval England, and if you're a, you know, some sort of medieval villager or something like that, and a bunch of brutes come in and go, hey, we're the boss now because we're going to, you know, it's easier for us to beat the crap out of you and take whatever it is you made than it is for us to make stuff. So after a while, that sort of solidifies. It goes from like that protection racket, like, hey, you know, there's a lot of dangerous guys here. So you may as well give us 10% of your wheat, your shoes, your sheep, whatever it is. We'll call that your tax. That's your protection tax. And then that develops out a little bit. Uh, sooner or later, it gets to a point where that becomes a logistics problem, right? Because you go, okay, now I've got a region of, you know, the size of London, and I'm going around collecting all the sheep and goats and wheat and whatever. But that stuff starts to spoil after a while. And if you're clever about it, you go, hey, here's an idea. How about we just make people pay in coins? You go, they got to pay their tax in coins to us to satisfy their tax. And instantly you create an economy around specie, around coinage, where you go, you have to pay your coins in tax. Therefore, you have to produce goods and sell them for this coin so you can get the coins so you can pay your tax. And then if you're the sovereign, you can turn around and take those coins and go, hey, now I can buy the stuff I need when I need it from the people I'm forcing to pay this tax. And so the, the idea of like how currency developed and this notion of like it was a natural development from barter to money to et cetera, et cetera, I go, it was a little flawed, especially in the monetary system we use. There's obviously been different types of money used throughout history. But the one we use today is sort of based on this idea of like, if I can force people to trade in a certain type of coin or whatever it is, a shell, a bead or whatever, and then I can use that same money to acquire those goods that I need. I don't have to store a bunch of stuff. Like I don't have to have grain stores that are going to rot after a year. I don't have to have leathers that are going to rot after a year and I can just pay people as I go and force them. So you get to extract that, that value from your population without necessarily direct, you know, stuff taxation, like they would have done early on. Like if your local gangster just comes down and goes, Hey, if you don't give me a sandwich today, I'm going to, you know, some bad guys might come by and wreck your store. You go, okay, well sooner or later, if he goes, okay, now I've got too many sandwiches. Cause I went around and, and held up all these sandwich shops and I go, I, I can't even eat all these sandwiches. This is a waste of time. So the smart thing for him to do is to charge that guy a different form of tax. Right. And then make him accept it when you come back to get your sandwiches or the next store down when you want to come get your phone or whatever. And, and I think that's a fundamental shift because it, it changes the notion from like money naturally evolved from trade to money was fundamentally from the start, a thing to steal from you. It just made it easier for people to facilitate the theft for these strong men to facilitate the theft. And, and that would be the thing I would say is probably one of the more fundamental it's slight, but it's profound in its implications, you know? I, I never heard that before. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that perspective awesome. on, on, on money. <laughs> I love oh, it so I love much. It. <laughs> and and then you're gonna come also to the to the point where Bitcoin is the first money you cannot steal. Correct. I mean yeah. uh, you you probably could steal most of the Bitcoin because most of the people don't have a, a good enough setup. <laughs> right. But but uh, if if you're really good in your setup or if if you like destroy your setup and, and just have a brain wallet, which I don't recommend because it's way too risky to like uh, yeah. <laughs> hit your yeah. head and then forget it. But it's right. in, theory, in theory possible to just like have it in your head. They cannot take it away from you. They can force right. you to tell you, but you have the choice to, yeah, <laughs> do a yeah. dive with my Bitcoin or give a, give a, a bit my Bitcoin out. Because if they uh, murder you, they still don't have the Bitcoin. Yeah, if anything gone. else, if you have a house, if you have gold, if you have anything else, they can just <laughs> hit you in the head or like shoot yeah. you and then they have the stuff. They don't need your permission. They, need, they don't At need all. your knowledge. And that's right. a fundamental change. Um, which also brings me to the question, like the next question, you also mentioned it now with taxation. Is 
will there be taxation on on a Bitcoin standard? Uh, is is or is it will be more like a fee based system where we like pay for services, uh, pay for protection, <laughs> pay for uh, whatever it is, pay for good streets, uh, and and is it, it's more optional and and less uh, forced on everybody by birth. Um, that, that's a great question. And to be perfectly honest, I, I can't really say how that sort of develops, right? What, what I can say is there's an enormous amount of momentum and energy contained in the system that we have, right? And there was a great post, I, I can't remember who posted it, if I had Twitter up, I, I could find it, um, that I reposted. And it was a quote from Hal Finney. And he said, look, man, I think, you know, the transactional value of Bitcoin, I think is pretty low. I think ultimately transactions are going to be between big banks, and there's going to be a second layer, whether it's banks or layer twos or whatever, they're going to handle the transaction component of it. And I agree with Hal Finney 100%, you know, and I think there's a lot of the transactional, like the black market money guys, like we need uncensorable transactions and, and they put a real high premium on that kind of thing. And, you know, and that sort of drifts into the big blocker camp and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I take a very different view and I, I sort of look at it like a bit because I understand like what sovereignty means and where the like property rights and people talk about property rights and things like that. And I go, ultimately, no one has any property rights on planet earth because the sovereign is the ultimate domain has eminent power over all those domains. So you go, this is my land I go, well, how come you paying tax on it? And here in the United States, we have a process called eminent domain. The, the state, the U S government can come in and go, we need this land more than you do. We're going to take it. And they're required by law to pay you a fair value for it or whatever, but they'll take it. They'll bulldoze your property and build a freeway on it if they think that's what they need to do. One of the more alarming things that occurred in the United States is there was a private developer that wanted to develop some beachfront property, and then they got the government to use eminent domain to take that property from private owners so they could give it to a private developer. And you go, that's not right, but they let that fly. So you go, well, if property, if your only right to property is guaranteed by a piece of paper from the sovereign, from the, from the state, you go, then you don't really have any property rights. The fundamental shift in Bitcoin is you go, well, your property rights are guaranteed by 625 exahash and, you know, 27,000 terawatts or however many terawatts of power that they're pumping out. You go, who, who is in control of that authority? Node runners? I don't know. I mean, nobody, right? And so that if, if you start thinking about just the way our system is set up, you go, our system is predicated on those who have property are the powerful ones, the more property you have, like tangible land or whatever it was. And it started off as land in the medieval times. And it's now gradually coalesced into like, how many buildings do you have and, and stuff like that. But that, that is the source of power, right? Property rights, property ownership. Um, but they're all, they can all be seized from you on some level. And if you create a system like we already have with Bitcoin, where you can go, anybody can own property with a egalitarian, zero trust access, nobody can prevent you from owning that property. No one can seize that property from you. That means that everybody suddenly gets elevated to the level of a property holder and a rights holder. And they have a say in how property gets distributed. And so when you try and exert your authority over somebody, you go, well, I'm going to seize your land. You go, well, good luck with that, buddy, because it's not my land. It's kind of been your land the whole time. I'll pack up and leave. Obviously, you don't want people getting disrupted like that. And I, and I do believe that we should have, you know, sovereign rights of like defending your right to be on that piece of property that you've developed and bought or whatever it is. But it, it fundamentally changes that calculus because if you go, hey, I'm in Ethiopia and I own property in Bitcoin City and I'm in the Sudan and I have property in Bitcoin City and I live in Peru and I have property in Bitcoin City and I live in the United Kingdom and I have property in Bitcoin City, like everybody can own a, a piece of this, this tangible property. And if that's the only source of power, then all power gets distributed globally. Maybe not perfectly, but you can't take someone's power from them at that point. And, and I think that's the, the sort of huge implication of this. I, I may have drifted off what your question was at this point. I, I tend to babble a little bit, but, uh, um, but that, that is sort of where I'm kind of landing on all of this and, and why I think, you know, like Bitcoin is, is such a huge deal. So it's a, it's amazing. There are so many great things to, <laughs> that were in there. Uh, the first thing that I want to add is um, you touched on like 
there will be like banks that uh, transact on, on Bitcoin and on Baseland, then there will be I 100% agree. I even made like a podcast episode with, with Wicked, uh, the, the guy from, from Twitter that made about UTXO management, a lot of stuff. And yeah. he is like, we, we all know there's like a limited amount of institutions and people that will be able to long-term transact on the base layer because other people will be priced out. And that's a good thing to have a secure, really robust base layer and then layer up and scale over layer te technology, like just like the TCP IP protocol uh, in, in, a, in a comparison. Uh, there will be, uh, as he said, around 10 million institutions or people that could theoretically trade uh, uh, per month. Maybe the number is 5 million, maybe the number is 50 million. It's, it's hard to, <laughs> to guess, yeah. uh, but uh, around that number and all, all others will be uh, on top of that will be a really interesting thing. And uh, there, there will be this, this thing where there will be big banks trading on it and some whales who got in in 2013, <laughs> which, will, which will be really, really fun to see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I just totally. wanted to, 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 to add that um, uh, in, in the conversation. Um, in, in that sense, and you also touched on that in, in, the, in the book, I think, um, how will then Bitcoin fix the, the, the financial corruption, right? which is a fascinating uh, topic for me. And it's still like for me, when it's just money, corruption will still happen in some, right. some sense. Uh, but uh, ca how can it be like uh, better on a Bitcoin standard? Uh, well, I, I, again, it's another great question. And I, I think um, the way this ultimately leads, and, and it's the title of the book, The Great Realignment, I, I think what it does is it realigns incentives and gradually, right? And the, the clearest analogy model I have is you go, just talk to anybody that's gone on a Bitcoin standard, right? Where they go, I'm all in on Bitcoin. That's all I care about is Bitcoin. I'm just saving Bitcoin. And then talk to them like a month later and go, how's your life? And they go, I don't know. It's just better. <laughs> you know, like everything's just a little bit better. I'm more focused on health. I'm doing this. I'm doing like everything all of a sudden is just magically lifted, right? Nothing at all changed in their circumstance except for that one shift. I went from fiat slave to saving here and hoping I get my 401k built up and trying to squirrel and just rat race kind of thinking. So like, oh, I, I'm just on this Bitcoin standard now. The, the beauty of that, though, is it, it encourages saving, right? And if you just strip it all away, strip all the artifice, strip everything else, you go, what are you doing right now? I'm, I'm saving for later. And that's the delay of gratification, right? And I go, if that has that impact on you, that has the impact on literally everyone I've ever seen that gets into Bitcoin. I've never seen someone come into Bitcoin and go, yeah, I went full on on Bitcoin. And then like a year later, I gave up because this seemed stupid and I just quit. And like, I want to go back to, you know, stacking ETH and trying to gamble on meme tokens. Like, I've never seen that happen. I see a lot of people kind of get in, dip their toe, bounce back and forth. And then they finally get that full on orange pill. And the next thing you know, they're just like full steam ahead. And their life improves dramatically because it shifts all of their incentives. It shifts all their incentives to that, that, that long-term thinking, right? That, that, that idea of like, I need to save up and I need to orient my resources into more important things. If you would have met me 15, 20 years ago, I used to think the greatest thing in the world would be to get an American Express black card and buy a new BMW every year on lease. I go, that's, I've made it, you know, by like just getting in, in, insane amounts of debt. Like at one point, I think I was carrying like three or $400,000 worth of credit card debt. It was insane. Just, I mean, absolute madness. And I felt very successful at that point. And I look back on it and go, God, what a toxic, just ugly human being I was living in that mindset. Today, like I drive like this little dinky, like I have a 2007 Toyota Prius that I just love keeping going and it just gets me around. I could give a, a rat's ass about what people think about it. There's, I, I have all that sort of idea around like, social flexing from consumption is just gone. And yet that allows me to put a lot more effort and time and energy into doing things like, Hey, I can come out here and spread the Bitcoin love and I can devote my time and energy to stacking sats. And I, I, I don't prioritize things that are wasteful, which then has all of a sudden allowed me to prioritize things like improving my diet and exercising more and giving time to myself. And, but that's all that incentive realignment. And I say, if it's true for me, it's true for you. There are human beings that run these big institutions, like whether it's Chase Bank or, you know, Target or clothing company here or, uh, you know, you name it. They're, they're all people and, and people 
I think like to look at them and go, oh, they're evil. They're doing evil things. And I go, well, there's, I th- it's a thing called Hanlon's razor. I'm pretty sure it's Hanlon's razor that says, you know, given the choice between assuming bad intentions or just assuming incompetence, you kind of always gravitate towards incompetence. Right. And for most of these people, I go, I, I think most people are generally operating from good intentions and sometimes they're making really difficult decisions, but fiat forces difficult decisions. Like it's continually crushing your ability to make good decisions. And the second you get off that standard, you get on a Bitcoin standard, it suddenly makes these decisions like you go, okay, here's the positive path and here's all the shitty stuff. And so you can just always choose the positive path. And if that happens on the individual level, when it happens on the institutional level, when it happens in the small business level, all of a sudden everybody is sort of going towards a positive path. We need to delay gratification. We need to save for the future. And we need to build things and structures around that that facilitate that. And you go, oh, what's the world look like when everybody is not short-term thinking scrambling to grab as much fiat as they can, levering up, going into debt, trying to cut prices, you go, oh, the world starts looking a lot better. Like just, and, and that's how I think it fixes that financial incentive. Cause pretty soon, it, you, even right now you go like, should I go and lever up and try and do all these crazy loans or should I just put Bitcoin in the balance sheet? Like Michael Saylor's just sort of going, look, this is super easy. Like I just buy Bitcoin and now I'm successful. And if all of a sudden everybody's doing that, you go, well, what what happens to like shrinkflation and what happens to the need to decline quality and what all this stuff just starts slowly evaporating. And it's, and I think there'll be a time when we kind of look around and go, Oh, everything's just better. Like no glorious revolution, no collapse and zombies and fighting in the streets. You just kind of things just get a little bit better every day until everyone's just kind of doing good. <laughs> and that's, that's how I think it fixes the financial system is, uh, so sort of a very optimistic, but I think very practical view on, on how this can unfold. You know, If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. It, it sounds so simple, but it's so profound. <laughs> and it's really hard to to get it across to to people that are not that as deep in Bitcoin, because when yeah. I talk to them, uh, that incentives are everything, and we have a lot of amazing quotes uh, that show that. I think, I mean, he was not really pro Bitcoin, but he still <laughs> achieved a lot of uh, things. And he said, um, I forgot his name, not Charlie Munger, the other one. Oh, Buffett. Uh, Oh no, it was Charlie Manga. So not Warren okay, Buffett. Yeah. It was uh, Charlie Manga. And he said, uh, show me uh, your five biggest incentives and I will show you what you will do. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and th- this is, this is basically it. Like, uh, and Bitcoin changes the incentives uh, in thinking long term versus just thinking, thinking sh- uh, short term. Because I see it. I, I was, I was in companies. I was uh, in, I also was uh, before Bitcoin. I was a lot of in conference calls. Like I did this, this, a, even weekly trading, uh, I mean, <laughs> I had a lot of luck in my timing and I made a lot of money with it, but uh, it, it was like I was on conference call and I was like, oh shit, this this happened on a conference call and I set then money on that and next week I made either 5,000 plus or lost 5,000, which is 
what what did I do with my um, with with my time? This is not productive. I, I did not right. spend time with my family. I did not bring any value to society. I just gambled uh, and right. had luck. <laughs> like that that's basically it uh and then and, and they have to say like uh what 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 is the better world when everybody is on a solid street can run or not run whatever they want to do and provide value uh or is it better to so, some are rent seekers sitting on the top of the <laughs> sand with like those those things where the, the lifeguard sitting in there and just uh, seeing everybody uh, f fooling around in, in the sand and the others are uh, in the in the sand and like uh, tripping over each other and, and not really coming along uh, it's 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 such a different world and it's it's hard to explain why it's so much better and i'm also like in in the process of writing my thoughts around that because this is the question i always try to to answer like how does this bitcoin standard look like on an individual level yeah. on a, like it's, it's 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 really hard to wrap my hand around that's why i'm always asking every every guest because <laughs> more people are uh, uh yeah um, oh, that's awesome, man! Yeah, the the one question that I I, I have in, the, in mind, a lot of people say like, "Oh, gold is also great." Like, ha mm -hmm. have gold uh, and Bitcoin, and I have gold, but it's not it's just an emotional value for me, not not something that I I, I would do for financial reasons. Um, do you think that Bitcoin is just the next evolution of money, and then just completely demonetizes uh, gold? which will would mean that gold crashes down to the utility value of like, what is it? 5%, 10% right. jewelry, <laughs> uh, and electronics, jewelry and, uh, and the smartphone use and stuff like that. <laughs> um, you know, gold is a funny one because I used to be a big gold bug. In fact, one of the things I would always, you know, when I was kind of crapping on Bitcoin is I'd be like, oh, gold is real money. And, you know, um, and yet that soon it, it became very sort of obvious that that's not a great, you know, store value or anything like that. Uh, it's roughly the simple fact that people have just appreciated it for a long time and you own gold. So you know what it's like, like when you actually hold a gold coin, there's something kind of special about it. Right. And one of the arguments I used to make is like, I'll tell you what, go find a 10 year old kid and say, Hey, go wash my car. I can either give you this gold coin or I'm going to solve this complex math problem for you. And they'll go, oh, I'll take the gold coin like 100% of the time. You don't even have to think about it. Right. Um, so it, it's hard for people that are used to tangible things like that to wrap their head around what it means to have like this network that's egalitarian access, egalitarian zero trust. Only I can have it as unseizable asset. That, that's a very abstract sort of thing that you got to deal with. Gold coin is just, you know, it's good. It's gold coin. Um, and ultimately, if you trace it back, like there's, I would argue right now, there's a reason central banks are stacking up all their gold and they always do this. Um, when their currencies are about to collapse, right? Like that, that is the a really, really good sign that things are about to go sideways. And they use gold because people recognize it as having value, like intrinsic value. And that is obviously a, a loaded term. Uh, if you talk to a, a true Austrian economist, I'll go, there is no such thing as an intrinsic value. And it's funny watching Peter Schiff get himself wrapped around the axle on this because he goes, well, gold has an intrinsic value. I'm like, you're supposed to be the Austrian guy, dude. Like you're supposed to know better than that's not... That's not an Austrian economic principle, but he'll preach those. The ones that he likes that fits his paradigm, he promotes. But, you know, when it comes to that one little sticking point, he suddenly is just gold, 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 right? Um, so central banks stack gold because it has that incentive. They understand gold very well, but they use that to bootstrap their next thing. And they go, hey, what, what gives your currency value? Why should we trust your currency over, you know, like me going, hey, it's, Daniel White Bucks, and we're going to use Daniel White Bucks. They go, well, ours is backed by gold. What's his back by? He goes, well, he, he seems like a nice enough guy, I guess. I don't know. But no one's ever going to take Daniel White Bucks, just like no one wants to take Venezuela Bucks because it's not backed by anything. But if you go, well, we have 216,000 metric tons of gold in our vaults, and that's what is backing our, what I think is going to be the next thing is going to be the CBDC. Um, th that's how you bootstrap the new currency. And if you think about the current U.S. dollar system, you go, where did that come from? Well, because of World War II and because of all the shenanigans going on in the world at that point, it was about 80% of the world's gold reserves were in the United States at the conclusion of World War II and something like 80% of the world's productive capacity. So you go, okay, well, if we're going to bootstrap a new currency to sort of kickstart everything and get everything rolling again, because, you know, Europe was broke there, you know, it was bombed into dust basically. And you go, well, who's left standing? Well, it's the U.S., 
nobody wanted to do this, but they used gold to bootstrap that. They go, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. It's going to be this little exchange thing where you can trade 20 bucks for, you know, or $35 for an ounce of gold or whatever it was. Uh, and that thing, I mean, it fell apart within about three years after they, they did it. Like the balance of accounts was already upside down, you know, by 48, 49, by the sixties, it was just wrecked, you know, because there, there's that incentive to just go, well, we can just print a little more. We'll figure out how to pay it back later. And then next thing you know, it's, you go, Oh, well, we don't have enough to pay it back. And, and so the whole thing falls apart. But the, the point is, is that they use gold to, to bootstrap the next scheme so they can give it some legitimacy before they go and start blowing it up and doing what they always do with it, which is inflate it and screw it up and, and try and skim their take while they're screwing everybody else at the same time. Um, and I, I think Bitcoin, you know, as, as the central banks try and do this, which is ultimately fine. They go, okay, we're going to create this thing and you go, all right, great. You're going to create some new inflationary digital, whatever thing. If your economic energy, your savings, your effort, your productivity is saved in Bitcoin, you go, well, it's, it's immune to that. So go ahead, bootstrap your new, you know, the, the Euro brick dollar or the, you know, the Fuji, Japan, China dollar, or whatever you guys come up with. I don't know. Priced in Bitcoin, those are all going to zero eventually. I mean, it might take 10 years, 15, 20 years. So I'll go, I'll just keep saving over here. I'll use your thing to transact in and to get my social credits or whatever it is I need to do to go get my bread and my milk. Um, but sooner or later, that sort of demonetizes that whole thing. And if if we can avoid that sort of calamity where the currencies collapse and everything and they have to reboot and reset, if we can kind of keep the system going and, and they've done a pretty remarkable job of kicking that can, you know, and just inflating their way through stuff. And I, I don't know how they bandage this whole thing together. And it's, it's kind of a miracle that these central bankers keep this whole scheme running, but somehow they keep pulling it off. And I think if we can just kind of keep that going sooner or later, it, it reorients the, their incentive structure as well. Eventually it's going to become very obvious. They go, Oh, well, instead of holding toxic asset backed securities that have no backing on our balance sheet, maybe we should just lump a little into the Bitcoin. And then, you know, as we're inflating and doing all our QE and all this just shenanigans, trying to prop the whole thing up, their little Bitcoin balance sheet can keep going up. And then suddenly they go, Oh, we're, Oh, we're actually not too bad right now. Like it's kind of our balance of accounts is even and then start shifting the other way. And they go, Oh, we don't have to print as much. And if the U S government is doing the same thing, they go, Oh, we don't have to print as much. And suddenly this all sort of just curves out and just levels out. And it's like, it's like a, a plane that's sort of spiraling out of control. And then the guy finally just writes the ship and you get it on level flight and you go, Oh, well, can we climb now? And you go, yeah, we're back under control. Let's just, let's see how high this plane can fly. And, uh, and so I, I think, I don't know if it'll be some catastrophic shift between gold to Bitcoin and, you know, gold just suddenly gets demonetized and goes down to the, to, to the value. I, I think what will happen is it just gradually, you know, God willing kind of thing you go. I, I think if we can sort of keep this little Ponzi scheme going for a little bit longer, sooner or later, those incentives are just naturally realigned. So gold just stops making sense. You go, well, it's pretty. I like holding the coins and, you know, but then you might have people that are like, Oh, I'm just going to build a gold statue. Why? Cause it's, you know, it's, 2000 sats who cares you know i'll just i'll just have you know 30 or 40 kilos of gold statue just because i like the way it looks but i i think it's monetary premium it's monetary value i think will just decline because it, it just doesn't make sense and uh, a lot of interesting things in there like uh i feel i feel like the the kids uh the, the example that you brought up um kids have a fundamental understanding now that digital things actually have value because they buy all those skins, they buy all those things in the video games, which uh, like the old, older generation in the childhood just did not have. So things like right. uh, kids from like 50 years ago, they probably would all go with, with, with the, the shiny gold thing because they're like, what is this digital thing? We don't even know about it. But right now, like they base so many things in, in, in the digital realm, it's uh, I feel like most of them uh, uh, would even choose the the Bitcoin thing uh, yeah. because it's digital and they they can they, they rather have something digital they have on the computer they can have on the phone rather on this like physical thing like they don't even yeah. know what to do with that brick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, it would be interesting. It would be an interesting study. Like get hundred uh, kids in a room uh, and give them the 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 choice between a digital Bitcoin or a small gold coin. Uh, it would, would be interesting to see the results. Uh, I, I don't know the, the results. Uh, yeah. but well, I think I've, I've seen. There's like oh, sorry for interrupting, sir, but there, I've seen 
there's videos out there where they go like, Hey, do you want a gold coin or a chocolate bar? And people are like, I'll take the chocolate bar, you know? So it, it's, it, it's really hard to say how it kind of ends up. I mean, people's, you know, like, would you like a Bitcoin or a chocolate bar? People go, I'll take the chocolate bar. So, you know, it's, it, it, it would be super interesting to see what they picked like physical gold versus a Bitcoin, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kid usually lives really in the moment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the moment, the chocolate bar is just so much better than the gold coin. Yeah. Yeah. What <laughs> I, am I can do understand. With this? <laughs> I can understand yeah. that. Um, uh, let, let's come back to the to the topic that we just discussed with with the uh, CBDC, with gold, with with the with also the kind of the change in the power structure, uh, mm. which I also heard a little bit out there, um, and all all the things that we basically discussed the last forty minutes. Um, how do you think? Is, is, is CBDC the last straw of, of the fiat system, the last uh, hope they, they can get with more uh, monitoring, with more control, uh, like get, get the plane under control uh, and, and have a little longer the, the complete control of the financial monetary policy? Uh, and, and how will then Bitcoin like change this whole, whole power structure? Uh, CBDC may be. I, I mean, when I was... Um... I, I frequently, well, let me preface this by saying like, I go and look at source documents, right? Like when I was, I was teaching at a, at a four-year college and it was in California right around the time the Supreme court there struck down a gay marriage law. Like they upheld a gay marriage ban or something like that. All my students came in and said, Hey, are you going to go protest the Supreme court's decision? And I said, no, said, what? Oh my God, you don't support gay marriage. And I go, no, no, it's nothing like that. Did you read the court decision? They go, well, no, of course not, but they, they're against gays and this and that. I go, maybe you should read what they said versus like getting all up in arms about what you think. Because if you actually go read the decision, they go, we support your right to get married. We, our hands are tied though, because if we vote this way on this, that means we have to undo 40 years of other laws. We can't do that. So sorry, get your legislators to make a, to pass a bill or something like that, but we can't do it because we're going to blow up the system by voting the way that we really want to. And we just can't. And I go, that's a very different story than the Supreme Court is anti-gay, right? Supreme Court is anti-gay. The California Supreme Court is anti-gay rights is much easier to sell to an audience. And Supreme Court makes difficult decision on gay rights bill because of past historical precedent and 40 years of legislative changes. And the Constitution has been modified so many times that this is the only result they could come up with. You go, who's going to read that article? People, they're, they're lost after the third word, you know? Um, so when it comes to the CBDC thing, like if you... And, and it's very natural. And I totally understand why people get there because they go like, oh my God, this is like surveillance state from China and they're going to come and social credit score. And it's like an episode of Black Mirror where you go and you go, oh, I didn't smile enough. And now my credit's gone and I can't buy coffee anymore and I'm poor. And, and it's a natural impulse and, and it could very easily lead to that kind of thing. And yet we also still have structures in place. But if you go read the actual banking documents, because they've been piloting CBDCs all over the place. And they tend to be very thoughtful people about what they're doing. They're very, very sober people. I, I met someone that worked at the at the Federal Reserve, and I go, oh, you're Federal Reserve Nazi, whatever. You see them, and they're just like, hey, how you doing? They got a polo shirt on, and they're, they're at the barbecue, and you're just like, you're you're the source of all evil in, in the planet? They go, no, they're just, just very sober, just kind of like, well, we're trying to do, you know, well, I mean, it's more complicated than that, and that that's sort of where I get to it. But if you look at the things that they find from these pilots that go, well, hey, some people expressed a lot of concern about financial privacy and not just for like, hey, I want to go buy drugs with this. It's like, hey, I'm buying a gift for my husband and I don't want him to know. And if it's just a transaction that's out there, then that's no good. We need some privacy. And they go, well, what if we made it so like the first thousand dollars are just private transactions after that it gets recorded. And then they have these other things put in place and they go, well, what if someone can't do this? Or what if someone can't do this? Or what if someone needs to do this? And they start trying to find little ways to integrate that. Ultimately, if you look at it, you go, well, we're on a CBDC already. Like just ask a Canadian trucker how much access they had to their money during that protest. And you go, none, it all just cut it off because it's all digital. It's all recorded. It's all on their ledger already. 80% of our transactions are based by card. You go to Europe, it's like 90, 95%. So you go, well, what's the difference? The 5% of people that are still going, I only pay with $20 bills or $20 Deutschmarks or $20 euros or $20 pound notes, you go, or 20 pound notes, whatever. You, uh, you, you kind of realize like that, that 
that dystopian nightmare has already descended upon us. Uh, with all these AML laws, like they've already they've already implemented all those controls already, and they've already got that infrastructure put into place. So the next step is just like an efficiency for them. It's not necessarily like this is going to grant all these extraordinary new powers. They just go, we've already got those powers. We're just trying to make it more efficient for this to get distributed. It net benefits them a, a ton because their seniorage goes to zero, right? Like they just make money off every little unit they create. Whereas right now they actually have to print some paper or mint a little, you know, allied coin or something like that. So in terms of the way Bitcoin sort of ties into that, you go, well, if, it, if it's your reserve asset, then it kind of doesn't matter what the unit of account for the rest of, you know, like if I go to Starbucks right now, I don't want to sit there and try and figure out how to get, you know, some way to transact that by trading a cork or a, you know, wood coin or something like that. It's, just, it's pretty nice just to be able to tap a little thing and go, okay, thanks for the coffee and walk off. Um, but if that becomes a lightning thing and you can tap and do that, that's great. For me in the United States, like every time I tap a lightning thing, it's why I don't use it because it's a taxable event for me. Cause you know, most my average buy was like 26 grand or something like that. And I was buying right at the bottom there at 16, eight. And I go, well, if I sell one of those sats for, you know, that's a 30% tax I'm just paying on my cup of coffee. I don't, I don't know if I want to pay that much tax to just so I can say I'm, I'm sticking with the Bitcoin standard. You know, I'd rather just tap my little visa card and then pay it off at the end of the month with my other fiat slave money. So, um, I, I think it, it just naturally gravitates towards uh, a system where some of that, those edges are going to smooth out. I, I think the need for people to try and track down tax cheats and all that, that's all AML was ever started from, as they said. There were these guys that would open Swiss numbered accounts, like Wall Street guys. They'd make a bunch of money on Wall Street. They'd open a Swiss numbered account. They'd dump their money in that. And they said, hey, you got to knock that off because you're hiding your tax returns. So the Swiss banks started collecting these pools of stock investments linked to the numbered account. So they'd buy all these stocks, they'd get all these gains, they'd sell all the stocks, and then it would all go back into this pool that these guys could draw from. They go, well, wait, which one of you made all the gains on the stocks? And they go, we can't tell because it's a numbered account. They go, oh, we're not doing that. AML laws, here you come. And they've just built it out ever since then because it's a very convenient tool for BDI little bean counters who are control freaks to go like, I want to know more about what you're doing. But uh, but again, like all, all our freedom was already evaporated. So the fear of the next draconian sort of megaopolis, you know, opticon tendril CBDC, I think they're a little overblown. It's still dangerous. I still don't support it. I hope no one listening to this goes, this guy's all for CBDC. <laughs> it's, like, it's nothing like that. I'm just saying like, as a practical matter, I, I think it's less, um, it's less like Darth Vader and more just kind of like just that annoying guy at work that you go, God, this guy's such an asshole. <laughs> you know, like, wish he'd just leave me alone. So uh, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's kind of I, my thoughts on the matter. I love that because it's more realistic. Uh, and I heard it's so interesting when I talk with people from Africa, they really don't care about CBDCs. Like they, they, they could care, they could care less about it. When I talk yeah. with German guys, they are really afraid of CBDCs. Like they are really like, oh, CBDCs, uh, they want to control more and stuff like that. I mean, there are also a lot of already a lot of uh, rules and regulations in Germany. So like, and then CBDCs, you have more control. Like, it it it's an easier sell. Uh, in yeah. in 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 Africa, like how many people are even banked? So like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's a whole a whole another discussion about that. Um, it, another question is like, do you see as as Bitcoin adoption is is for you El Salvador a good role model? Is is that like we have still the fiat system? But we introduce Bitcoin as a legal system. There's no taxable event. Uh, the government slowly starts buying Bitcoin. Um, like that's basically they started mining also Bitcoin. That's basically their their Bitcoin play. They did a lot of other things to make El Salvador more attractive, but this has barely something to do with Bitcoin, with the free passports and and the gangs and stuff like that. But uh, the integrating Bitcoin as a legal tender, integrating Bitcoin on the balance sheet, integrating Bitcoin mining to make uh, some cash flow even from that. Uh, is that the is that the handbook for for global adoption in 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 the future for all countries? Potentially. I, I, I think the thing that's going to happen is like people have been saying for years, there's a supply shock coming, right? Like it's going to get crazy and people are going to start going, oh my God, like look at number go up. And people will point to the 2021 run up and they go, oh my God, look how much Bitcoin, you know, exponential growth from like 2009 to 2021 or 2011 to 2021, if you will. You go, there's this amazing run. I go, yeah, but that was all like just 
guys like you and me just kind of going, we Bitcoin, you know, and then you got a bunch of stimmy checks and guys like you and me are sitting at, you know, working from home or whatever. And we go, Hey, I got an extra 2,400 bucks on my stimmy check this month. Like we're off to Bitcoin. Cause I'm kind of taken care of already. I'm not worried about it. And so you get this big, huge run up, but it's a retail blow up. I mean, it was, it's sort of memeing at that point. Right. Right now, the people that are memeing are BlackRock and Fidelity and Bank of America and JP Morgan. And, you know, like these, these major institutions are now getting into the meme phase for themselves. Uh, but those guys are bringing stacks, right? And you, like, I think you posted a chart, you know, of like all these um, like corporations stuff that are putting Bitcoin on the balance sheets. And so to your question about El Salvador, I think what's going to happen is like, it, it's like if you had bought like, Amazon stock and you had this balanced portfolio or something like that, you know, as your stock increases, you rebalance, right? Like that's the a very common thing to do. You go, well, I'm overweighted on Amazon now, so I'm going to cut that down to here. But if you caught Amazon at the right time, there could have been a time where you had like, let's say a $10,000 portfolio, $1,000 of it was Amazon. And then the rest was like stocks, bonds, whatever, mutual fund crap, whatever composition you have for that thing. And then you had this big, huge run up. So it's like, oh my God, Amazon is 90% of my balance sheet now. Like, how do you rebalance that? Because it's it just went from this one sliver. You didn't add anything to it. It just magnified so much that it's overtaken everything else. And if you just think about how much Bitcoin El Salvador is carrying on their balance sheet right now, because right now it's sort of fluctuating. People kind of, I don't know what's going to happen with the price. And there's still that sort of speculative kind of thing. But when the supply crunch actually hits, because as every bank sees what someone else is doing, they go, well, how come we're not? Oh, we should probably just do that too. But they're they're on autopilot. They don't they're not thinking about this. And some of these things are going to become passively invested. They just go, oh, just allocate one percent, whatever. We don't want to miss it. And so when those flows start coming in and they run into legit scarcity, then all of a sudden number goes up. Like it's going to make the twenty twenty one thing look like you're going to go. It's going to be a blip this big on the chart. People are going to go, oh my god, you you could get Bitcoin for that because it's like three billion dollars today or something. But if it gets to that and El Salvador's balance sheet is all of a sudden like, well, it's 98% Bitcoin just because number went up so much. The rest of their balance of accounts, like everything they fund their government is on is like you can't even see it on the pie chart anymore. You go, well, what's that do to global adoption? People just go, oops, oh, we should probably get that going. But it, it fundamentally changes how they do stuff and that they're mining it and you know, they're just getting basically free energy. They've got a volcano sitting in the middle of the country and they just go, hey, we get free Bitcoin out of this. This is cool. But I, I think people really underestimate the power of like what number, when it really goes up, what number go up is going to look like. And to those even, you know, like relative to Michael Saylor, El Salvador's holdings are kind of smallish, right? But relative to me, like it's going, oh my God, these guys have a ton of Bitcoin. But everybody, as that starts going up, it, it has that effect of other people ramping up it's, it's just like a speculative mania in 2020 2021 except it's corporations and finance companies but sooner or later that smooths out that curve gets to a place where everyone's just holding it and the like you know the the notion of getting rid of it is absurd but if you're a country there's a ton of countries the ukraine has forty six thousand bitcoin the united states is holding a couple hundred thousand bitcoin russia holds x thousands of bitcoin when number goes up and all of a sudden El Salvador is like the third most powerful nation in the world by GDP, right? You go, oh, maybe we shouldn't sell this Bitcoin anymore. Maybe we should just incorporate that under the treasury balance sheets. And, and I think that's probably how it comes around is, is just this massive wall of adoption and massive amounts of number go up. And the people that are already holding are just going to not want to get rid of it anymore. It, it would be it would nonsensical be non to not have it, you know. And every every one, every country, every institution, every person, every bank has to have like a Bitcoin strategy at some point, and most of them right. don't have till now. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. and and those who have now will have a way more um, advanced uh, strategy on that. I'm I'm often wonder like is is the way till there is the way till this uh, trigger point till this mass adoption just time is it just time that has to, to basically pass and then bitcoin has to function and, and has to prove more and more and but is, is there anything else that do you see as a main hurdle to, to the bitcoin adoption anything that that you like um it's just time that we have to pass to, to this this thing yeah i i think it's inevitable i really do um and it's an exponential curve right like if you look at the derivatives market for instance right um, that's the overcounter derivatives market. The thing that blew up the world in 2008, the thing is still a gaping black hole out in the economy right now. 
uh, that was an exponential growth curve. And so you had people like Alan Greenspan in 1999 or 2000, going, I think the risks are mitigated here. And, and, you know, you had Warren Buffett going like, these things are a, a financial time bomb, like a nuclear bomb. And what they didn't anticipate though, is, is because of the way the derivatives trade, they start off with like $60 billion, you know, being hedged in the derivatives market by 2008, that had blown up to 600 trillion. You go, wait, what, how did, and the thing is, I don't think anyone was just like, yeah, let's, let's pump this thing up to the moon until we can just absolutely fracture the entire global economy. I think what happened was just mass adoption, right? These guys just went, Oh, those guys are doing it. We got to do it. We better get in on this. Oh, and number go up. Hey, that's cool. Let's keep doing it. And then one day it just, it sort of trickled along and then it just went, whoop, you know, that exponential growth occurred. And then everybody stopped in 2008 went, wait, what did we build here? And you go, Ooh, that's, you don't want to look under that hood, dude, because that's bad. And, uh, but that, that's what exponential curves look like. That's a negative exponential growth, right? You go like, Oh, we exponentially grew a bubble that we can't fill. Like there's a hole that we can't fill. Bitcoin is the opposite of that bubble, but I think it happens the same way. I think people just go, oh, yeah, oh, they're getting on Bitcoin. Oh, we should get in Bitcoin. Oh, well, number go up. I wish you get some more Bitcoin. And then next thing you know, everyone just goes whoop and you go, oh, oh, oh my God, like what happened here? But when they look around, the world looks very different than when you're standing on top of a $600 pit or a $600 trillion pit. You're standing on top of a $600 trillion asset and you're going, oh, this, hey, this is kind of cool up here. Like a lot of our problems just went away. And we don't even have to play this game anymore because look at all, you know, the, we fixed this debt mountain. We fixed this need to issue all this debt. We can now focus on things like quality or we can just not do this anymore. I can just go on vacation with my kids. I cannot sit here and grind 12 hours a day in a Wall Street firm trying to grind out, like you said, gambling and trading and just, you know, and sacrificing family and everything just for fiat bucks. And I, I think a lot of this stuff just drifts away, you know, and then. You go, what's the world look like there? You go, I don't know, but I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Like, I think it'll be very, very different than what we're used to. I would hesitate to make any predictions. And yet I think just these notions of like how we enforce territory and property and, and why people are even incentivized to do that. You go, it just, it stops making sense. If you go like, I could either hustle you for five bucks or I can just buy this thing and get 50 bucks. You go, oh, I'll just buy the thing, and get 50 bucks. And, you know, it, it uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be quick, and, and I don't think anything stops that. Like, you know, it's, it's fun to say nothing stops this train. I just don't think people have quite wrapped their head around what an exponential growth curve in Bitcoin adoption looks like, because it's going to be insane, I think. I think it's just going to be where people are just – because we don't have a model for it, right? We've never had something like this. Like I said, it's the first time in human history when you had something that's got this monetary value, this this asset value, and it's – scarce like you can't get more of it so when it happens it's that gradually then suddenly well i think the then suddenly is gonna it's gonna be that face melting kind of it but it but it's all positive like it doesn't hurt anybody when it goes up right like nobody gets harmed from that from that growth so it's it lifts all boats even people that don't have it their boats are going to get better because you know their stuff becomes less expensive they have less it's easier for them to get by. And even people that go, Bitcoin, I would never own that. Don't understand it. Can't understand it. Can barely check their email. Don't think about it. They just care about watching football or rugby or whatever. They're just going to be looking around going, hey, things are better. I don't know. I'm going to go have a barbecue and drink beer with my buddies this weekend. And, and I only worked 20 hours this week because my boss said I could go home. So I don't know. It's cool. Um, and they won't know that it's Bitcoin that did that. It'll just be life is better. And I, I think that's how it plays out because who would want to stop it at that point? You know, like who's going to go, no, we can't have all this success and, and peace. This is terrible. Like we need to interfere with this as quickly as possible. <laughs> you know, it just, it stops making sense and it starts looking, the arguments against it start looking really absurd and you kind of go, yeah, yeah, pretty much everybody is just, even the people that are diehard, Peter Schiff sooner or later is just going to go, okay, fine. It's a good idea <laughs> and hop on board. So that that's kind of how I see things playing out. Uh, I, I hope for Peter Schiff that he has at least a little bit of a Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, and for, because if, if he watches it since, I don't know, since 2012 or what the first debates were, then he, he made, I mean, there, there's this memes where he, his face gets older and older and like gold price goes down and Bitcoin price goes up. But it will be interesting to see. Um, I also really love how you describe it. And I'm also really a big believer in only a small portion of the uh, population will ever understand Bitcoin. 
Yeah. Like there will not be like not all of the sudden just because Bitcoin is uh, is now here, all of the sudden seventy percent of the population is sound money in Austrian economics experts. This <laughs> this will not happen, even though it would be awesome, uh, but it will yeah. not happen. But they will have Bitcoin in some capacity because they will have maybe an ETF where there's companies in there that only hold Bitcoin. They uh, might get compensated bonuses with, with Bitcoin because the company uh, gives, with, gives Bitcoin out or uh, they might even get paid in something that is backed by Bitcoin. Like the, there's this whole hybrid system and then we might end up at a full Bitcoin standard, even though I, I think this is far away. Uh, even for me, even though I'm just 25 years old, I, I don't know if I actually see it in my lifetime. Let's see. Um, but even now, like uh, even now, Tesla owns Bitcoin. Tesla is in the S&P 500. How many right. people own, 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 own the S&P 500? A lot of people. So you, all, all those technically own a really small amount of Bitcoin, but yeah. uh, even, yeah. in, even that is, is, is true. And when Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy gets involved and then maybe in 10 years, uh, almost all S&P 500 companies have uh, that, uh, that Bitcoin advantage. And this is where it comes, gets difficult because as you said, this exponential uh, growth phase is really hard to understand because yeah. people yeah. Uh, overestimate what, what's happening in the next like one, two years but they completely underestimate what's happening in 10 years, 20 years time. And this will be, yeah. will be fun to see. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always stoked when I talk to Bitcoiners and I'm like, I should, I have to buy more Bitcoin, uh, but I'm already <laughs> for, for all in. So this, this train is <laughs> yeah. hard to get in. Um, yeah. Before I get to the end routine of the podcast, I want to get one more topic down because, uh, Seinfeld is actually my most favorite uh, series oh, of all time. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Uh, and that's why I just wanted to uh, ask, like, how did you get into that? Like, how was that, 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 that thing? I, I also saw, like, uh, because I'm an actual big fan, I saw one thing where uh, Seinfeld and the, the actors and um, uh, I forgot the name of the, the director, who who directed it uh, did talk about like stories how they like made the script and and how they developed Seinfeld and how they like even made some some episodes who like touched some edges uh, and it was it was fun to fun to see this these things um how was it to to get in there and and how was the that experience and how did you get uh, into Seinfeld um well it it wasn't just Seinfeld like uh, the company I work for there there's like the there's a part of the show where they shoot the show, like what we're doing right now. And then there's the part you're going to do after this, which is the editing and the cutting and the post-production and clean up the sound and all that kind of stuff. So I worked with a company that did that and I got there like right in the early nineties. And so if you're unaware, like there was a time when you couldn't do this, right? Like this, like digital recording and HD 4k was just, it required an insane amount of horsepower at the time. Um, so my company sort of bridged that gap. There was a time where like all television shows were cut on film. Like there would be a room full of 50 guys that would have reels of film and they'd cut each one according to a cut list and then they'd stitch it all up and then they have to make prints of that. And then, you know, and then they'd strike that off to a videotape sooner after a while. Uh, we sort of became a middle step where we could transfer directly to digital and then edit digitally, but on tapes, right? Like these are these big sort of professional type tapes. And the company I worked for was particularly good at not only forming those relationships with the studios, but doing that process. Um, and so we basically put all the film editing guys out of business because we could do it all digitally. And then the computer guys came along and like we could do with 10 people what they took 50 or 60 people to do. Well, the computer guys came along and could do with two people what it took us 10 or 15 people to do. So we kind of evaporated in the middle of it. But it was right during that time that like Frazier, Seinfeld, uh, we did a lot of post-production for film films at the time um, and a lot of broadcast duplication, things like that. So it's not like I was hanging out with Seinfeld going, hey, buddy, that's going on, like what's on the next episode? Uh, but I did get to see some kind of interesting stuff around that. But I, I basically stumbled into it. I really did. Like I was working at a clothing store of all things. And the lady I worked with, her husband was the chief engineer there, and he was this kind of character, big wild hair guy, and just, hey, man, you should come by and work over here, and you know, and then he'd wander off and get a pizza or something like that. And I didn't know anything about the film industry. I didn't know anything about post-production. I, I just wandered in, and I saw a bunch of people in nice clothes running around carrying paper and looking really stressed about stuff, and and movie posters all over the place in this like sort of immaculate-looking building. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't know what's happening here, but it looks pretty cool. I want to be part of this. 
And then I just didn't quit. Like it's a pretty nightmarish job. It's, it's, you know, it demands a lot of time. It's a 24 seven business. And like, if there's a broadcast date or if there's a film release date or something like that, it's, it's not flexible. Like they can't say, Oh, we didn't finish the show this week. Let's just do it next week. Like that just doesn't happen. Right. And if they go, Hey, we're releasing a movie to 3,500 theaters. Ah, can we do it tomorrow instead of today? Like it's, you know, it just doesn't happen. So they, they place a lot of demands on your time and sacrifice a lot of time and stuff like that with family and friends and important things just to be part of that industry. Um, so that's how I kind of got into it. Uh, a friend of mine was actually one of the assistant editors like in our house. And like when they did the final episode of, of Seinfeld, this is probably the most interesting story I have about Seinfeld was they, they literally shut down the building. Like they wouldn't let anybody come to work. Like they canceled all the edit suites. They canceled all the film transfers, everything. It was just the editor, the assistant editor and the producer. And that's, those are the only people that were allowed in the building while they cut this final episode of Seinfeld. And then when I saw it, I was like that, I, I couldn't come to work that day because of this, this, you know, I, I wasn't too impressed with the finale, but some people liked it, I guess. I don't know, but yeah, it was pretty weird just watching how much security they, they incorporated around just that one final episode. But yeah, but other than that, it was just, you, you get to see a lot because you're looking at the behind the scenes, like between takes of what they're doing and you kind of get some insight into what that production process looks like. But yeah, like I said, I wasn't like I was hanging out with the film crew or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah, I was also a little bit, uh, I mean, I'm always um, not satisfied with finales. Like the right. last episode, I, I never saw a really good finale. Uh, but yeah. I, with that, I was really not satisfied. I mean, I mean, it was cool to see them all in the court and, and have those, those past uh, characters come in and, and all the scenes. But uh, in, yeah. in general, I'm like, there are a lot of things that could, could have been done, but it's it's uh, it's it's an amazing series. I, I love it. I think... Uh, I feel, Probably I have seen all the episodes on average like two or three times already. It's like uh, it's it's uh, I'm I'm the ca kind of a guy that does not watch a lot of TV, but when it's like the same thing all over, <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. But yeah, um, uh, before we get to the end routine, uh, what are you currently? I mean, it's kind of my end routine already because I'm asking all my questions, but uh, all, all my my guests this question: What are you currently extremely passionate about, which we did not? touch on in the podcast anything that comes to your mind uh oddly enough i would say no like we we talked about the stuff that i'm super passionate about right now like all my focus right now is on on writing this book and promoting bitcoin you know and outside of that i'm pretty dull you know like i like to golf once in a while and i'm terrible at it but you know that that was a passion but all those all these things that used to be something I might have considered a passion felt very fiat to me now. You know, like I look back and go, ah, that's kind of a waste of time. Like maybe play video games or something, dick around on the computer. But the rest of the time is just thinking about Bitcoin. Like how can I talk to people better about Bitcoin? How can I promote Bitcoin better? Um, and it, it's sort of the mission I've put myself on. I go, I just want to spread as much knowledge and information as I can about Bitcoin. I want as many people as I know to get involved with it, to think about it, to talk about it. And, uh, you know, even where I work right now, I'm, I'm, I probably shouldn't say it out loud, but I'm, I'm trying to push them towards like adopting that uh, and, you know, and, and kind of tracing it up to government level in terms of people adopting it and holding it and using it. And the Wisconsin Pension Fund has made it hugely easier to even just start having those conversations. But it's I, I kind of consider my process similar to what Sailor has been going through for the last few years. Like, how can I refine my message to a place where I can get the most people to understand why this is important, why they need to be part of it? And I also consider it kind of a duty. Right. I just go, hey, look, it's it's like Noah and the Ark. You go, hey, floods coming. You might want to hop on. And I, I don't like the cynical view that says, oh, well, if you don't get it, drown. Like I go, no, nah, how about we help these people get up? You know, like let's help as many people get on this boat as we can. And ultimately, I, you know, if, if I take it away from the doom and gloom Noah's Ark scenario and I just take it into the, like, well, the more people we get on, the sooner we get that exponential curve that you were talking about. And you go, I, I see it in 10 years. Like, I could see it in two. Like, these things happen, boom, and they go quick. And when they start running, it, it's, it's pretty astonishing what happens. It will be disruptive, certainly. And yet, for all those people that don't get it, their, their lives will get better, like, if, you know, I think Eric Stacks, it was your show that I found Eric Stacks and that guy's been hugely sort of transformative in my perspective on a lot of things around Bitcoin. Um, 
but he talks about like housing. You go like, well, right now, 40% of the houses in the United States of America are rentals, which means someone owns a house they don't need so they can make money because they're trying to protect themselves from inflation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens if you put 40% of the houses back on the market? You go, oh, well, it makes it easier for everyone to buy a house, right? And you go, well, what happens if we don't have to pay a premium for stocks and all this kind of stuff? And you know, then these companies, if they're just holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet and they don't have to keep trying to push a premium and push their revenues and take on debt and do all this, they can just like take whatever meager profits they have, they put them in Bitcoin, it goes up and they go, oh, we don't have to worry about cutting costs and reducing quality and, and centralizing further and further. We can start specializing, we can increase quality and our, bank sh- our balance sheet keeps going up. So, so everybody benefits from that sort of positive feedback loop. Even people that don't know what Bitcoin is and would never buy one if it you know, but all of a sudden their stuff is cheaper and they can afford a house and they don't have to work as long or as hard and they still get the things that they like. They can still, you know, buy their beer and, but it's getting cheaper every day. It's not getting more expensive or the beer that they are buying gets better. It's higher quality. It's got less toxins and metals and shitty ingredients and whatever, but the food gets better. The, you know, everything just starts going. So, so yes, my, my energy is fully devoted to seeing that come as quickly as possible. Because I'm older than you are, so I, I don't know. I might not get to see it <laughs> if I'm not careful. I want to. I want to make sure I'm as loud of a voice as I can be for whatever worth it it has, you know, to whoever might find it worthy. So, I mean, my incentive would be to talk shit about Bitcoin so the adoption is slower, so I can stack more, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that would be my incentive <laughs> to to get more Bitcoin for the future because I'm yeah, 25. Don't buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, no, <I'm, laughs> Sorry, guys, I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is uh, a terrible idea. Never buy Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm I'm humble enough to see that I probably have uh, zero to uh, little to zero impact on the Bitcoin price long term. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's it's pro- probably better for my uh, uh, for for me to to just like be honest with the guy <laughs> with few people. Yeah. Um, uh, our Andrew is, uh, as I already said. Uh, uh, the previous guest is asking questions. Uh, is asking a question for the next get, guest without knowing who the next guest is. It's always interesting because there are really cool questions coming up, technical questions coming up, weird questions coming up, uh, and uh, deep questions coming up. And uh, it's it's that one question in the show that is not tailored <laughs> for for the guest for you, Daniel. Uh, and the question is, how would you get your neighbor to love their neighbor more? Oh, wow. You know, oddly enough, in my line of work, it's all a communication business. Like I work in the criminal justice system here in the United States. And a lot of that work is about getting people just to get along. Um, The way I would most try and get neighbors to love each other is to try and humanize both. Um, And, you know, one of the things, if you really want to cut down someone's hatred on somebody, just ask the person if they go, I hate that guy. And I go, I go, that's yeah, I can see why you hate him or whatever. What kind of pizza do you think that guy likes? I go, oh, pizza. What, what do you mean? What kind of pizza? Well, just think about it. I mean, like, look at him. You think he's a jerk. What kind of pizza does he like? It, it instantly humanizes somebody, you know? And so it's, you, you have to find things. If I want neighbors to heal relations, you go, you got to make them seem human. You got to get somebody out of that loop of thinking like they did that on purpose. It's evil. They did this for this and this and this. It's tricky. It's not easy. But if I had neighbors that hated each other and I really wanted them to get along because it makes my life easier for whatever reason, that would be the start would just be because it's it's about effective communication. It's about empathetic listening. It's about being able to hear someone's point of view and and empathize with it. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but they go, I think that guy's the biggest jerk. And I can see why you think that. I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world. Even if someone's saying it to me, I think you're the biggest jerk. I go, I can see why you think that. Like, it's not, you know, people, oh, how can you say that? You're not a jerk. They want to fight. I'm not a jerk. You know, I go, yeah, it doesn't matter. That They think you're a jerk. You're not going to talk them out of it. So may as well just acknowledge it. Say, yeah, I can see why you think that. And I did it for this. This is the reason why this has happened. A, did you think about, A, did you know their dog died? And what kind of pizza do you think they like? What kind of ice cream do you think they like? I saw that guy had maple ice cream. Can you believe that? I go, maple ice cream. He likes maple ice cream. But it, it doesn't change what they're thinking about, but all of a sudden it, it makes that person a person and it, it helps just tamp that kind of stuff down. So that, those would be my steps. That, that's a, <laughs> that, those are great steps. Um, where can people so. find you? Like is, is uh, where's the best place to read about your stuff and where's the best place to ask you questions? 
Uh, well, my writing, my book, you can find on Tin Money. That's T I N Money, M O N E Y dot medium dot com. And that's where I'm writing the book real time. And you can read those. You know, I got about a, two, a third of it maybe done right now. And you can also find me on Twitter at Tin Money TV. And that's uh, where I sometimes post occasionally interesting stuff and usually just shit post a lot. But <laughs> I'm kind of a reply guy more than anything. But yeah, those are the two places to best find me. Uh, this uh, reply guys, uh, I, I love it because uh, the, this is uh, the, this is the most interesting in 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 in, in Twitter re re interacting with each other and then then shit posting. It's uh, I love I love the game honestly. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I mean, you do a really good job of it. So yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, then perfect. Uh, thank you for for being on and for everyone watching. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with another guest. Bye bye.